Hi everybody, I'm Paul Fryer, Worldwide Tech Lead for Retail at AWS. And I'm here today with Pedro and Josh from Tapestry to talk a little bit about their experience and their journey on migrating to the cloud and then accelerating data science once they were in the cloud. And so what I wanna do is go through a very quick introduction of our team, the retail team at AWS. We're a global team that uh, consults with retail customers all over the world. Um, we like to say we're built uh, for retail, born from retail. And we say that because a lot of the services that we're building in AWS for retail specifically have been uh, spun out of Amazon.com. That's one of the advantages that we have of working with so closely with Amazon.com is a lot of the best in class things like forecasting or personalization we're able to deliver as services. And that's one of the things that we're able to talk with customers about. We also talk a lot about uh, use cases, which might span everything from, uh, you know, grocery companies that want to do in-store analytics with computer vision or RFID or apparel companies that want to do, um, you know, design planning or they want to do uh, merchandise optimization. There's a, there's a whole range of use cases. And uh, SageMaker is one of the things we talked about a couple years ago along with Tapestry. Uh, I was on the stage with Tapestry. We did this, I think, three years ago, and they were just starting their journey on um, their, their kind of cloud-based data science with some serverless technology. It's going to be pretty exciting to see where it's gone. Josh is going to walk us through that. And then Pedro is going to give us um, sort of a backstory of how a lot of their migration work happened and what's changed and how... Um, they're operating today in the cloud. So just a, a quick kind of uh, mention of some of the customers we work with. You know, I did mention we span all, all segments of retail, and it's, and it's true. Um, today, we're going to be focusing a lot on apparel, but we, we certainly work with customers that are doing, um, you know, everything from supply chain optimization to uh, buy online, pick up at, at a curb, to um, just really optimizing their, their digital commerce websites to go multi-region in some cases. So we do a lot of, of that. And um, the thing that, I, that we're going to get into today, though, is really a couple of use cases around data science uh, for apparel use cases and, and migrations. So with that, I want to turn it over to uh, Pedro to start uh, with the introduction of kind of their tapestry's journey to the cloud. Thank you, Paul. My name is Pedro Figueroa, and I head up the Global Cloud Strategy and Engineering Group at Tapestry. I'm happy to be here to talk about our journey. Tapestry is made up of three iconic brands, Coach, Stuart Wiseman, and Kate Spade. Stuart Wiseman and Kate Spade, we, we, uh, we acquired via acquisition, um, which meant that we acquired their technology landscape along the way. So it gave us an opportunity to kind of look at what are we going to do next, because there were some challenges that we needed to address. First, we had a lot of data centers along the Northeast, all housing you know, different types of applications that were essentially doing the same thing, really clustered in the same general vicinity. In some cases, those data centers were in high risk areas, flood zones. In other cases, they were located in buildings that facilities wanted to deprecate. So we needed to have a strategy that addressed those challenges. In addition to that, within the data centers, it's been a while since we made some investments within the data center. So we were trying to take every single ounce of useful life out of the equipment, which meant that we were in a position where, you know, if we didn't make some investments, obviously that's going to affect our availability, our capacity. So we needed to really think about what we were going to do globally on that scale. Each brand also had its own way of doing disaster recovery. We had to make sure that we had a consistent RPO, recovery point objective, an RTO, recovery time objective, which we didn't have. And then finally, our business was moving at a, a speed and scale that from a technology perspective, we needed to keep up with. The old legacy rack and stack model just was not going to cut it there. So with all this in mind, we looked at it and said, instead of changing this in a step-by-step -step function, what can we do strategically to move ourselves into the future? That's where we decided to partner with AWS. And it was a great partnership because part of what we wanted to do is, is give us all the flexibility. We just talked about things we didn't have. Um, and we had to do it in, in a really consolidated time frame. We were very successful. I think part of the, the success there is we needed to build a strong AWS foundation that was secure and capable of holding QA development and production workloads. We needed to make sure that 
that was also um, uh, to connect it to our network and an on-ramp perspective and give us all the capabilities that we needed to reach every single region in an optimized and an efficient way. We also took this opportunity to make sure that disaster recovery was, was available across all the regions. And I think one of the biggest things that we did was we were able to move to an infrastructure as coal model, which is something that you know, we hadn't ever done before. It was a really a, a, you know, a big evolution for us. Um, but it also gave us the idea to put us our, position ourselves in the future for DevOps and for things that we wanted to do with serverless technology as we move forward. The whole thing was, you know, for us, it was a, it was a, a bit of a, you know, it was a big, a bit of a sprint. It was a bit of a marathon in a lot of cases, but we were very successful in that piece. We were able to close nine data centers, um, which was huge. If you can think about how data centers are a core to every single company, and, and a lot of those things have been there for for a lot of years. So figuring out, you know, how to move those things was a challenging process overall. Um, we were able to reduce about forty percent of our environment. Um, just because, you know, some things have deprecated through uh, rationalization, through consolidations. We were able to address our security concerns and replatform about 65% of our environment, which was huge and really closed a lot of holes that we did have. And finally, we moved about 48% of our applications, business applications into the cloud, which, which, you know, was obviously we've done that in different ways. We had a replatform approach, a, trans, a transformation approach. And a, and a lift and optimize approach wherever it called for, right? So it was really a per application uh, move into the cloud. So we're very, very proud of that. Um, this needed to be done really around the typical people process and technology uh, state. From a people perspective, our SMEs needed to bring up their skill sets. Where we partner with AWS for training, we partner with an S our SIs to take their knowledge. We needed to develop a CCOE, which really brought together the best of infrastructure and applications to make sure we were doing the cloud in the best way possible. And then we addressed the, t the, oper uh, the operations component, which was really important for us to make sure that we just don't implement something in the cloud, but we know how to manage it going forward. And that required us to partner with our, our providers and our vendors from a people aspect. From a process, you can imagine that all our existing um, activities were always built on rack and stack and, and, and implementing it, you know, via the 30 to 45 days, we had to change that model through automation, through the infrastructure as code. But more importantly, we had to add processes that we never had before, build muscles that we never had, including cloud management, including auto, you know, auto sizing and, and um, right sizing our, our environment. This all made sure that we were managing our environment in the cloud for the long term, which was really important to us. And then finally, from a technology perspective, all this had to be built on a strong technology foundation, not just from an AWS perspective, but also from how it integrates with other, with other services. All this really got us to the point where we can build this differentiated platform in the cloud, really providing the basis for our applications and our application teams and our business to build upon, you know, and really be one of the, the key drivers behind our overall growth strategy. Um, you know, a key pillar of that is, is consumer insights. And, uh, and, and my colleague, Josh, was going to talk about what we've done there. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Hi, everybody. My name is Joshua Ainsley. I'm the head of data science at Tapestry. And the data science organization fits within a, a larger, larger analytics group. Um, whose mission is to take all of the data assets that we have that Pedro was just talking about and turn them into something that's usable for tapestry and brand employees to become more data driven in the decisions that they make. Um, the analytics organization, it, we, we have three main groups that focus on different aspects of the things we need to do to produce these analytics. We obviously have a data engineering group. Um, you know, when you are a global company that has stores all across the globe, we sell, store, sell our products both in, in physical stores and, and online. We have to produce and design all of our own products. It produces a massive amount of data. Um, and we, you know, we need to get this data into a centralized and usable form while also making sure that we're, we're following all applicable uh, privacy laws and security concerns that, that can be very different across the globe. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a, definitely a, a challenge to, to do this well. Um, we also have a software development group. So, you know, if we produce any, any sort of models or statistical analyses, we want to make sure that these are in, in a usable form so that our brand employees and, and business partners can use them. So we build a lot of dashboards. We use a, a lot of APIs. Um, we create a lot of interactive web tools that enable our, our insights to get into the hands of the people who need them the most. 
And finally, we have a, a data science analytics group that focuses a lot on building out uh, deep dive analytics, statistical analyses, and producing predictive artificial intelligence and machine learning models to be able to uh, uh, optimize and even transform our business. And I want to get into a few of the ways that we do this by talking specifically around challenges we face in our supply chain. One of the main issues we have is, is, is ensuring that we can get the right product in the right place at the right time so that it's there for when a customer who would be interested in it, is, it is, can see it, get delighted by it, and purchase it. Um, so we do a lot of, of, of demand planning, and there's multiple stages. When you're a company that, that uh, does everything from designing the product to getting into the hands of the customer, there's a lot of, 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 of places along that supply chain and, and that can be optimized. So we focus a lot on, on each part, each, each of those areas. Uh, the first one we talk up, that I want to talk about is our design process. So when you're designing fashion products, this is, you know, this is done repeatedly. It's on a consistent basis. We have new products coming out monthly in, in most of our brands. And for this to occur, uh, the designers have to produce a lot of data, a lot of text data, a lot of images, a lot of metadata that is, is produced and, and aggregated around products before a physical product is even made. Um, and this is all very unstructured. None of it is in a nice relational database. So we, we actually partnered with Amazon and one of their data science teams to build out a process utilizing SageMaker to extract text from the different PDFs and the different ways that we collect this data and put it into a usable form. So it's ready to go and, and for people like me and the analytics team to start analyzing that data and producing insights from it before uh, the product is even, we've even made decisions on whether we're gonna buy that product or not. The next thing I wanna talk about is creating an assortment that we're actually gonna to, to sell within our stores. So uh, all the, we have a large team that focuses on building the assortments, taking the ideas that design has and deciding how many they're going to purchase, which products they're gonna buy and how many they're going to buy to put into our stores. Um, this is a very complicated, it's a very critical process that usually has to be done with very limited information. In many cases, there's no information on how this new product will sell, only the, the, the text and image data that I was talking about to describe the product. And they can use their expert opinion to be able to say, you know, this product is very similar to one we had a few years ago. We think it'll, it'll sell about this well. And we can use this to make decisions on how many products we wanna buy. Um, data science and analytics can have a, a, a strong impact on this by helping to take all of that text data and all of that image data and turn it into numbers that we can use to build models with. Um, and a couple of examples of how we might do this would be um, defining the, assort the, the diversity of the assortment, trying to have uh, specific measurements of how similar two products are to each other. You know, two black totes might have small changes in their, in their, um, in a few designs and they would, could be considered, you know, very similar products that you can use to learn how the new product will perform. Um, we can use this, uh, 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 this information also for the last step of our supply chain, which is allocating products. Once we have a, a set number of units uh, of a particular product, how do we figure out which stores we need to put it in and how many goes to each store? Um, and so this is a very complicated process as well. If you have thousands of products and hundreds of stores, that's a lot of forecasts that you have to create. And they all have to be accurate. Um, or else, you know, you're going to to have all sorts of challenges around missed revenue if you don't send enough products to a store, or if you send too many a store and they take up space for new products when they need to come uh, in. That you know, you need to get them out. So that usually involves discounting. So we have to um, build a lot of very accurate forecasts to ensure that our allocation is as optimal as it can be. And one of the ways we do this is by creating what, we, what are called embeddings to describe our products. So we want to, I want to talk a little bit more about exact, exactly how we build these embeddings. Um, and these are, embeddings can be defined as uh, low dimensional numerical representations, something that can be used in a machine learning model that's created from some sort of high dimensional categorical data, like images or like text. You can't just take an image directly and put it into a, a machine learning model. It has to be translated into a form that's usable for that model and, and, and it is able to be understood by that model. And so what we do is we build these embeddings on our products. And usually these are very purpose-driven models that can take diverse data and turn it into a numerical representation. And an example would be taking images of our different handbags and classifying them into the type of the handbag that they are. So for example, we sell shoulder bags or totes or, 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 uh, or carry-alls, and those all have different shapes and different silhouettes and different lengths of the straps. And that's all information that can be represented in an image turned into numbers, and then used to classify that product into the right bag. 
into the right bag category. But once that's made, you have a numerical representation that describes that product. And we can do all sorts of interesting math with this. Um, so we can use those embeddings directly as features in other machine learning models. Uh, one example would be the forecasts I was just talking about. We can use it for um, product recommendations. If you have a numbers that represent a product, you can do math with those numbers and figure out how close those two embeddings are. If they're very, very similar to each other, that usually indicates the products are very similar to each other. And we, we use um, these embeddings in a lot of different use cases. And so I wanna get into a few details about how we use these embeddings in, in a couple of specific examples. So one of the, the things that we can do is try to, like I mentioned, determine how similar products are to each other. And so once we, once we have that and, and can look at the numerical representations, um, what I'm showing here is uh, an example of, of what these numerical representations might look like if we were to plot them in, in a two-dimensional plot. And so each one of these colors here represents a different kind of handbag, either a shoulder bag or a tote. And what you see is that the, co the co different colors generally kind of group together. It's not a, you know, a huge rainbow where you have a dispersion of, of, of different colored dots all over the place. Similar bags that are in similar categories are generally seem to be represented in, with these embeddings in a way that they're, they're very close to each other. So this shows that we have useful information that we can pull from these, the, all the text and image descriptions that we have. Uh, and one of the ways that we use this most heavily is in our forecasting capabilities. So um, with all the different types of information that we have around our products, you know, we have information around the stores and how well they do. We have seasonal information. Obviously, Christmas and Mother's Day are very important fashion holidays. We have um, actual sales data from uh, similar products. We'll have things like weather or traffic. There's a huge amount of data, images of the product's text, and putting it into a, a certain kind of model called a neural network is, is a useful way to um, tackle all of this diverse type of data and put it into a, one type of, one useful model. Um, and so what we're sh I'm showing here is an example of, of, of a structure of one of these kind of models, where over on the left, we have these group of dot, these group of orange dots that all represent um, different kinds of unstructured data, the text data or the image data that we can turn into embeddings. And now using a neural network, we can actually marry that data with all of the other data that we have around our sales, around our stores, around our customers. We can use that to create a demand forecast. We can compare that to our actual sales and try to optimize the, the whole model so that it is producing a forecast that is as accurate as possible and matches what we would expect to see. Once we have that forecast, that helps us solve a lot of our challenges. We can use it to improve the, the accuracy of our allocation process. If you could know a couple months in advance how many units you're going to sell of a particular product in a particular store, our allocation process becomes much, much easier and much more optimized. Um, we can roll this up to another level. If you know how many products you're gonna sell within a group of stores serviced by a particular distribution center, it becomes much easier to know how to allocate our products from the factories to the distribution centers so we can minimize shipping costs from our um, distribution centers to our stores. So these embeddings represent a, a real and, and useful um, uh, description of fashion products and, and enables us to build a lot of really, really powerful models to help our, our businesses become more data-driven. Thank you, Josh. That's a very interesting uh, set of capabilities that you're building in the data science team, which is um, great to hear after, Pedro, your, your opening around, you know, the initial sort of start of the journey. You built out all these capabilities, these organizational processes, and now you've got teams that are actually delivering value to the business. Um, so I want to get into a little bit of Q&A to kind of unpack some of your experiences and a little bit more details on, on um, how some of those worked. And maybe, Pedro, if we could start with you, um, what, what were some key lessons you learned during that migration? I mean, that was a pretty significant thing. What, some of those numbers you put on in terms of closing data centers, are there any key kind of lessons learned uh, as part of that migration? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it's a great question, right? Um, it, it almost sounds a little bit cliche, but part of what we learned was was the alignment from all the way from executives all the way down was really critical. Um, the entire technology team, the entire IT team really need to see this as a priority for them. And in our space, in the retail space, it's really difficult. I mean, things change, you know, very fast. We have holiday blackouts that we are trying to work around. We're trying not to impact the business while you know, while making these big changes. So, you know, alignment on prioritization and it's important is, is key. 
I think the other piece that we saw as we started to, to go through it was um, security, uh, you know, making sure that what we're implementing is implemented in a secure way. Obviously, we are very sensitive in our space around security, as a lot of companies are, um, but having them part of our journey and actually helping us lead our, uh, our implementation was, was really critical for us. And then finally, you know, the organization. I mean, I think it was important to, for us to bring the organization along from a, from a skill set perspective, invest in our people and partner with the right people. So I think, we, you know, we had established those relationships and really worked together to make sure that we were successful across those different things and, and you know, a lot of learnings in those areas. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. There's a lot of uh, kind of people and process changes um, the getting the business involved all the way from top down is a, is a theme that we hear over and over is, is that's what makes for successful migrations. Um, did you, did you also, you know, you kind of mentioned this in your, your intro, but, um, did you also find that you, you are starting to build applications differently now that you're in the cloud and, and, and how, how is, how exactly are, are you doing that? Like what, what has changed now that you're in the cloud? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I mean, when we looked at our application landscape, we did do an analysis just to kind of see, you know, what each application was, where it was along its own life cycle, um, and which applications we were going to invest, which applications we were going to get rid of. The applications we wanted to invest in, we looked at it across the spectrum. One, you know, can we update the application, you know, at the highest level, can we transform, right? Serverless and, 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 and all those microservices kind of approach. Where that couldn't happen, could we replatform? Could we take advantage of some cloud native technologies across the board? Um, and in some cases, we were we were very successful in that. And then the other cases where you know things that needed to be shifted, and maybe we can optimize uh, along the way. So we kind of looked along all those different um, uh, different aspects of our application development, uh, with the idea that we wanted to make sure that we set ourselves up from a platform perspective to really get into our foundation pieces that can support DevOps and everything else in the future. Yeah, yeah, plat platform is kind of a key word that uh, we, we're seeing with customers that they're really looking at their um, IT resources as uh, capabilities, capabilities to power the business, to make the business run faster. And, and Josh, I wanna, wanna talk to you a little bit about that because I, I feel like you've also taken that mindset around building platforms and capabilities for the business and really talk, you're talking to the business in terms of like allocation of, of merchandise. And it seems that you're, you're going pretty strong with, with the use cases. How do you, um, you know, is that, is that something you're going to continue to do? Can you t speak more about your, your process for delivering value or capabilities back to the business through, through sort of a use case lens? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think every single model we build has to have some sort of defined use case. Uh, you know, the worst case scenario for us would be we build, we spend months building a model, um, uh, produce the model, get ready to deploy it, and we find out, you know, the use case no longer exists or it's not, you know, we didn't match the model to exactly what the business is trying to solve. Uh, so, you know, in general, our strategy is to make all of our analytics sort of people first or employee first. We're not going to just build these models in a silo, deliver them and say, here, here you go. Everything's done in collaboration with our business um, from the very start. So ideation, how do we come up with the challenge that we're trying to solve? What's the right analytics approach? You know, how deep do we need it to go? Does it require a new model? Can we repurpose some other model? Um, are we sure that the output's going to be acceptable to the business? You know, if we aren't sure we can build a model with the right level of accuracy. What's the risk there? What's the fallback solution in case we you know the model doesn't work as, as intended? Um, so and all of that has to be done with the business all at every step of the way. Otherwise, we're going to be producing uh, useless useless uh, products. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. And and then when you when you decide you're going to go after a use case and you're going to you know do whatever it takes to build the models to support the business. You have a lot of options on on AWS, right? You've got managed services that are, you know, our highest level AI ML model services. You've got sort of mid tier platform like SageMaker, where you've got you know hosted Jupyter notebook environment. And then you've got access to just raw compute power. If you know, like our, our deep learning AMIs, for example, can you walk us through kind of your your process for? picking the tools that you do to, to do your, your AI ML development. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, I, we, we often have to marry the technologies we're using to our actual goal. So you know, there's, there's often limitations. You know, does the model have to run in real time to service something on our website, or can it run in batch? You know, for example, if we're we're labeling customers based off of their their characteristics, that's something that you know we could run overnight. And then late, so latency is very different for both of those. Either it has to be always on demand with high uptime and high uh, high speed of delivery, or it's something that can happen through a larger ETL process. And so you know, those are two important things we have to look at uh, when we're deciding technologies. Then we have to think a little bit more about how customized we want our models to be. Um, often, off-the-shelf models are good enough to get started and go, get going. And like you mentioned, SageMaker, they have a lot of off-the-shelf solutions. Um, but very frequently, um, you know, we are a global company with three different brands that have three different, you know, many different things that they care about. We have many different regions, different types of customers, and other ways we have to customize our models. And so, you know, a lot of times, we do fall back on uh, building, you know, very tailored models. You know, do we do we what, what, what specifically around the loss function we're trying to optimize do we care about? Are there different penalties for, for over forecasting or under forecasting? You know, I gave an example uh, where sometimes if we send too many units to a store, that's, that's bad because uh, you know, maybe it takes longer to sell them and there's a cost for holding it in the store. Maybe you have to discount it to make room on the shelves. But it's even worse if we under forecast and you know, we don't have enough product for the customers that are coming in. So in that case, you know, we have to think very carefully about exactly the, the, how we want to penalize under forecasting versus over forecasting. And so when we build these more customized solutions, um, you, you mentioned, you know, SageMaker does offer the option to, for us to, to build our own custom Docker container, a, a, a sort of encapsulation of the model and run it within SageMaker, get the benefits that you can use for the automated uh, parameter tuning and things like that. Or we just fall back on, on you know, spinning up an EC2 instance and, and directly running our code and our models there. Gotcha. And, and I got, you know, this, this kind of raises another question around when you're going into these new spaces, whether it's, you know, embarking on a new data science platform on a, maybe a new cloud that you haven't used before, or you're migrating for the first time, you, we find a lot of times you need help. Like you need, you need a partner. Um, and Pedro, let me, let me start with, with you. Was there, was there anyone or any companies that were able to help you along the way that were particularly useful on your journey? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I, I think uh, you know, I mentioned it earlier, but, you know, we, when we started this process, you know, we as an organization, you know, from an infrastructure perspective was new to the cloud in terms of, you know, how we were going to operate. So, you know, the first part of that process was really to develop a business case and really analyze our environments, our data centers, the business case objective around, you know, kind of moving into the cloud. So we partnered with Unisys to, to help us to do that. And, and it was a good partnership and we developed a business case and then we were able to, to take that and then start the, um, you know, start the overall program. Um, once we got to the program uh, level and we needed to execute, you know, we did do a search to find and have a partnership with someone established in the cloud. We wanted to make sure that their capabilities were more integrated with cloud native, uh, more, more born in the cloud type um, experience. So we partnered with Second Watch to help us on the implementation side. Um, and so those are the two companies that helped us kind of get us from, from you know, kind of from where we were to, to where we are. And then along the ways, obviously, we had a lot of different, you know, partnerships and, and companies that helped us, you know, supplemental build and consulting and all that good stuff. Great story there. Um, some interesting outcomes. I think when we look at, you know, Pedro's story about the journey to AWS, the, the setting up of the platform with combined with what you guys are doing, the data science team to provide capabilities back to the business is just really a, a powerful story. And it just raises one last question. I want to open it up to both of you. Why AWS? What, what is it about AWS that was different? I can I can I can start that. Um, it's a great question. For us, it came down to a number of different things, right? Um, we looked at it from a services perspective and what AWS was able to offer for us, and we believed that it gave us the best options out there for us for to be able to take advantage of platform as a service, to be able to take advantage of the different database types, EC2 instances, you know. Um, so there were a lot of options from that perspective. The other piece was a lot of options around cost management and our ability to manage the cost, because we've all heard the stories around cost overruns. So we wanted a lot of flexibility there, and AWS did provide that for us. Um, I think when you look at it, the other piece at the time that we were looking at was stability. And AWS, from a stability perspective and a market leadership perspective, 
was definitely the top and continues to be the top. Um, and finally, when you look at, you know, kind of where we are and what our team is doing and what were the industry was doing, going with AWS gave us an access to a larger resource pool, skill sets that we can take and leverage and enhance and bring in folks that have expertise in this area. It was really an exciting piece of time to, for us to be able to take AWS and their technologies and really integrate it within our own skill sets and also bring in folks who already had that within, you know, in, in other areas and help us along this journey. So those were the main reasons that we, we, we decided to go with AWS. Yeah, and I'd love, love to add a little bit to that as well. Um, for, you know, from a data science perspective, uh, two of the things that we, we care about the most are our speed. How can we get our solutions out quicker? And flexibility. So how can we make sure that, you know, if we were to build a, a model that works well for Coach North America outlet stores, since we have multiple brands all across the globe, how do we build it in a way that, that's uh, flexible but also scalable so we can do the same thing for our stores in uh, Kate Spade, Japan, for instance. And so, you know, we, we uh, AWS has lots of uh, services that are already sort of pre-built, pre-built models in SageMaker. There's there's all sorts of different models you can run out of the box and try to see what you can get with with uh, the, you know the, the built-in forecasting or, or product recommendation offerings that that AWS has to, to use, and then be able to deploy them quickly across the globe. But also, if you don't want to do that, you can still fall back on building your own model specifically custom tailored to exactly what you need to do, and still get that scalability. So you know it's um. It, it solves two of the challenges that we have to use, um, and especially if you want to be transformative as a, as a data science organization within a, a larger company. Um, you need to make sure that you're, you know, you're producing the, the results that are going to be there in time. Retail is a very fast business, and you want to make sure that they're going to be able to, to scale as, as quickly as we need to. Um, so it's uh, AWS kind of fit the bill there. Okay. All right. Well, I well I want to thank you both for uh, you know telling your story, walking us through the journey that Tapestry has been on. Um, look forward to seeing what's what's next for Tapestry. Uh, Pedro, Josh, thanks again for joining.